even now, I mean, just our own existence is a miracle, right? And in Israel, you know, the Jewish people say mitzvah, you know, it's a miracle. It's a miracle because you think about, you know, the tragedies that have happened in the past, the fact that so many people, I mean, just the struggle to exist, just the struggle for even our history to exist. All right, I'm still in Israel. And today we are going to rock and roll with the Dead Sea Scrolls. I knew it sounds cheesy. I know it. I know it. I know it. But I had to do it to my producers. I am uh, so happy to bring this to you because I've said this before on the podcast and I, you've probably heard me say it. My dream has always been to come to Israel since I was a little girl. Um, I grew up in Saudi Arabia when my dad worked for Lockheed Martin. It was just um, a I guess an unusual life, but it wasn't like I had a silver spoon in my mouth. My dad was a mechanic for Lockheed Martin and we had the opportunity to go there and he took my family and we spent a good portion, almost eight years of my childhood there. And so I was very used and accustomed to the shopping, the shopping bazaars, the souks, right? The open markets, the smell of uh, fish, you know, as the fishermen brought in from the Red Sea, their fish and, and put it in that fish market. And I could remember shopping with my mom and, you know, going through the gold souk or the material souk where they would sell material. My mom loved to sew. So we were always in there. It's just ancient. It's an ancient way of bargaining and doing things. Um, and it exists still today in the Middle East. But my dream was always to come to Israel. Um, I, you know, and no matter what, it seemed like I was always going someplace else. And I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you, but you get that feeling where you're compelled to do something. And when I was invited by Tom Homan and Tom Trento, uh, uh, when I was in Florida, they said, hey, Sarah, do you want to come to Israel I just said yes, without even thinking twice. I was even telling, and for those of you who don't know, um, Tom Trento is with United West. Um, Tom Homan, of course, former ICE director uh, for President Trump and worked under numerous other administrations with Immigration and Customs Enforcement and a patriot, both of them, uh, of the United States and, and really fighting uh, to protect border security, among many other things. But they, when they asked me, they said, do you want to come to Israel? And I just was like, yes, I'll go with you. I even went on a video with them to say, I'm going to be there. I didn't look at my schedule. I didn't talk to anyone. I just knew I had to go. I just knew it was the right time to go. And I'm here now. And I feel so fulfilled because I feel in a way that I'm with I know I'm with friends here and then family. I know that Israel is probably one of the greatest allies of the United States. It is such a tragedy what's happened under the Biden administration, but I'm not going to live into that. I'm going to bring back my love for this such this beautiful nation and and the Judeo-Christian values that were established first here thousands of years ago. And that's where I'm going to take you today on this podcast, because I had the opportunity to go to Qumran. And this is where the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls took place. This is where it was that moment when, and it's, it's not too far from Masada, and I visited Masada as well. We were in Masada, which was basically the last fight against the Roman Empire uh, when 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 the Jewish people of Masada stood up to the Roman Empire and for four years held them off until they no longer could. And I'm going to tell you that very tragic story about the end of Masada and why that story thousands of years ago and why the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually relate to us today. It actually fits in with what we're dealing with today and what our, the way our lives have and our societies have formed, the way we think and what we do, and also how we protect 
our borders. And I'm going to tell you that and so much more. And first, I want to tell you about Allegiance Gold. I love Allegiance Gold. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for being on my podcast too. Um, and for sponsoring the Sarah Carter show. It means so much to me. And right now you can get $5,000 of free silver on a qualifying purchase when you tell them that Sarah sent you. My friends at Allegiance Gold can help you protect your IRA or your 401k with physical gold and silver. Or guess what? They can have it delivered directly and securely right to your front door. Isn't that amazing? $5,000 of free silver on a qualifying purchase when you tell them that Sarah sent you. So don't wait. Call or click today at 877-702-7272. That's 877-702-7272. That's 877-702-SARA, S-A-R-A. Or go to protectwithsarah.com. We can't control the Biden administration, folks. We know that now, but we can prepare. 877-702-7272. That's 877-702-SARAH, S-A-R-A, or go to protectwithsarah.com. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit first um, about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this was an incredible day. First of all, let me tell you about the Dead Sea. It was probably one of the most amazing experiences I've had in my life. I mean, it's up there at the top 10, Right. You know, you don't expect it. You hear a lot about the Dead Sea, but you don't expect to see and feel and touch it. I mean, just the just the whole experience of floating in the Dead Sea was incredible. And I mean, you really do float. So for those of you who haven't been there, it's just nothing lives in the Dead Sea. It's full of salt. And it is, it's so heavy in its salt content that it lifts you right up to the top. And under your feet, you'll feel this mud in certain areas, just this very, it's like squishy. I don't know how to describe it any other than it's just like very soft, squishy mud. And you can stick your hand in there and you grab it and you rub it all over your skin and you paint your face. And of course, everybody laughs when you do it because you just look ridiculous, right? And you kind of hang out there and it's hot and the water's warm and you're just floating there. And as you float, like the rest of the world just disappears. It just goes away. And the funny story was, I I just thought it was really interesting. Cleopatra considered that her like private bath is what they were saying there. And, And they have this really cool bar at the Dead Sea and it's called the lowest bar in the world because it's one of the lowest points in the world. And so apparently the bar that was right there serves alcohol. Of course, it's a regular bar Um, and they have showers that they have hooked up outside and you can kind of rinse off and, you know, you enjoy your time with your friends and then you take off and you go to Qumran, which is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And I think this is just an incredible story. Because it was the Jewish, like Jewish monks, Jewish priests, they were called the, and I want to pronounce this right, and I just don't want to pronounce it incorrectly again for the 900th time. They were the Essenes. So I'm going to pronounce this correctly. I, I hit, I actually hit my computer right now just, just to do this. And, and by the way, it's 12.09 a.m. my time, so you got to bear with me on this. But anyways, back to the Dead Sea, right? Super amazing area of the world. Um, And this area of of Israel is very deserty. It was very hot, um, around 109 degrees. Um, And when we left the Dead Sea, we traveled to Qumran, where the Essenes once were these monks who lived in solitude. And they, they would transcribe all of the stories of the Bible. And And this is what is so phenomenal about what happened there. You know, we look at the Bible and we think to ourselves, well, it must have been changed for all these thousands of years, right? That there have been maybe significant changes to the Old Testament or the New Testament. But when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, the scrolls that were discovered, you realize that the translation is almost perfect. I think the last one that they found was the book of Ezekiel was the book of Ezekiel. And it was 
literally verbatim, verbatim, which is a miracle in and of itself. And it was a a young boy, apparently, who was a herder, sheep herder, goat herder um, in the area, goat herder. And he was trying to get his goats. There's Now, let me describe the place for you because it is these beautiful mountains, right, with these caves, just thousands of caves or hundreds of caves. I mean, with and and they go deep into the mountains and it's almost like painted red against the sky. So imagine these beautiful red mountains, barren, like a barren desert um, and caves all along the way. So as you're driving down the road, you can see them and you can just imagine what life would have been like there thousands of years ago. And you can see the excavations once you get to the museum in Qumran, because they do have this fantastic museum there now. And you can see some of the Dead Sea Scroll parchments there yourself. And you can see how they lived, how the Essenes lived. And they lived in, you know, they had these very, uh, they had separate quarters. Each one uh, had an individual quarter. They would, you know, make their own food there. They would live there for several years and they would transcribe. And their job was to transcribe these scrolls and they would hide them inside these vessels, right? These vases inside the caves. And they would do that to protect them for perpetuity for the future. Like they were already thinking about that, but they would protect them from the Romans and from other conquerors that would try. So they wanted to protect the books of the Bible. And apparently this herder, he threw his rocks at his you know, goats that were up in the mountains trying to get them to come back down. And he threw a rock and it hit one of the vases and it broke and you could hear it in the distance. And that was the beginning and the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The manuscripts were discovered in 1947 and then in 1956, and they were in 11 caves um, near a place called Kirbet, Qumran, um, on the northwestern shores of the Dead Sea. They're approximately 2,000 years old, dating from the third century BCE to the first century CE. Think about that. Even during the time of Christ, even during the time of Christ, they were working on these scrolls. These ancient priests, right? Dedicated to saving the written word, the written word of God. And I can't begin to explain, even when I was, and I'm, and I'm going to get to some of the, the other parts that we saw, but when I was there, there is this feeling, this feeling that we belong to something bigger than ourselves. This feeling that, that God is real, right? And that even now, I mean, just our own existence is a miracle, right? And in Israel, you know, the Jewish people say mitzvah, you know, it's a miracle. It's a miracle because you think about, you know, the tragedies that have happened in the past, the fact that so many people, I mean, just the struggle to exist, just the struggle for even our history to exist. And you're walking through these ruins And God, I hope you all get an opportunity to do this, to travel to this part of the world, to see this kind of beauty and to feel the hospitality of the Israeli people. I mean, there's just nothing like it. I mean, they are so wonderful. And all of the culture here is rooted in these ancient traditions, right? That so many of us, aren't even a part of, but that they have not forgotten, right? That they have not forgotten. And you see it in the dances and you smell it in the streets as you're walking through the bazaars and you feel it when you walk through these ancient, beautiful art of, you know, uh, uh, discoveries like Qumran, you know, and where the priests live. Or I went to Masada, for example, and talk about being blown away. I went into Masada and it was haunting. 
It was up on a mountain, this great, once great city, great city, Herod the Great, right? This beautiful city, this beacon on a hill. It looked like marble, the writings of Masada. It looked like marble from the ground. It was, it, they shined the stones so much, the limestones, that they shined like marble. And on top of the hill in Masada, they had grown, they had their own agriculture. And I'm going to tell you why this relates to us. This is very, very important. Very, very important. It's why I'm here in Israel to begin with. Can you imagine living on a hill? You're guarding your family and your community in this great city on a hill from you know, Romans and invaders and criminals um, and empires that you don't even know exist. I mean, your world is so small, right? The world was different then. So what do you need to do? You need to protect your people. You need to protect your borders. So you build a city on a hill where you think nobody's ever going to reach this hill, but it's in a desert. So how... Do we get water to our people? They built cisterns in Masada, massive cisterns that captured the water, that captured the water from the rainfall and from other parts of the valley. And they had a type of irrigation that even flowed up. They created a city on this hill with agriculture. So on top of the hill, they had farmlands. And you know what they did, which was even more fascinating to me because it was like, wow, you know, we don't give our ancestors enough credit. We don't give uh, them enough credit at all. They put their like border patrol, right? Their soldiers all along the outskirts of the city. So on top of the hill of the city, every single home that was on the outside facing down this mountain, right, was a soldier's home. He could be at home with his family, and if he heard something at night, he could look through his window and protect his community. And it worked for a long time because it wasn't until the Romans came that they destroyed so much. I mean, they, they destroyed Jerusalem. But I wanted to climb Masada myself, and we had my hiking shoes on. I was ready to go. I was going to climb Masada. It was incredible. But then the hiking trail was closed off because some of the rocks were coming down and because of the heat. But its length is about 2.7 kilometers. The total climb is about 350 meters up to the top. So the city was built in 35 BCE, right? So during the construction of the palace, um, so many people died. Um, it served as the primary access way to the mountain. Um, this, this road that went up to the top, they call it Snake Trail, which is incredible. So you say, well, Sarah, how did you get to the top? How did you and your group get to the top? Um, there is a massive tram uh, that takes people, two of them, in fact, that takes you all the way to the top of the mountain. It's really incredible. You can see the whole valley from the tram and it drops you off on top. And then you can get your tour. You can walk through the city. You could eat your lunch up there. It's, it's really incredible. It's a, it's an, it's an amazing place to see and everyone should see it. Um, in fact, the Romans built a ramp that's for four years, Masada was, was fending off the Roman Empire, right? So they had their cisterns with water. They had their border around uh, that protected them. But there was only so much that they could do because they were a city on a mountain. And the Roman Empire was it was just massive. And the, and the Roman soldiers that were there held out and they wanted to finish them off. So the end of the story of Masada um, just so, you know, is not, you know, a celebration. But what had happened was after four years, uh, the Romans had built this massive ramp, a ramp where they were, they kept building on top of it. We, the, the Jewish uh, people in Masada could not keep them away. They couldn't stop the Romans from building this ramp. And so the Romans kept coming. They kept coming. They kept coming. They kept attacking. Masada would attack back. Finally, the Romans 
were already advancing and they advanced so far, so far in 73 uh, AD that the leader of Masada um, basically went to all of his men in leadership and said, there were 900 and something of them left in Masada. And he said, what are we going to do? Are we going to become slaves to the Romans? Are we going to give our freedom away? Are our wives going to be raped? Are our children going to become slaves? Or what are we going to do? Are we going to end this now? And what happened was a story of such tragedy that even when you're up there, it's haunting. Um, he basically sent his men. They killed their wives. They killed their children. They killed each other. And according to the story, one man in the end took his own life because it was against Jewish law to take your own life. But there was one man left and he took his own life. Now, according to the legend, there were two women uh, and three children that hid or survived that massacre. Um, when the Romans got to the top, their homes were burning, the city was in ruins, and everyone was dead. And the story is this. They were willing to die than give up their freedom. And I guess back 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago, I can't even imagine what life would have been like as a slave. But it was bad enough. It was bad enough that they wanted to take their own lives. And I got to tell you, as I walked through the homes, you know, and with reverence, right? And I saw these you know, imagined what it would have been like to farm, what it would have been like for the children to play. And they had these huge cisterns and they would swim in them. And sometimes they would swim and splash in them so that the soldiers down below would hear them, you know, so that they could scare them away so that it would sound like there were more people there than there were. So they did everything they could to protect themselves. And their borders worked for a long time. But eventually you know, technology and, of course, advanced Roman soldiers and numbers. They were outnumbered and they could no longer protect themselves. But think about how important borders are. And when we have an administration that tells us that we shouldn't care about the borders, right? That we shouldn't, that there shouldn't be borders. You have a leftist group that says, you know, radical leftists that say, Oh, you know, there should never be a border. Every human being is a legal human being. Well, no, that's not the truth. That's not the truth. We could lose everything if we don't protect our borders. Our adversaries will take advantage of that. Our enemies will take advantage of that. The reason I'm in Israel is because I believe that we have to learn from each other. And we need to learn from our ancestors. There is a reason why we have nation states. There is a reason why we have city state. You know, why cities existed, why towns existed, and why we protect our families and our communities. And I feel that we need to heed those lessons. And we need to listen to our allies. And we need to listen to each other and to our ancestors. I'll be back in a second. But first, my pillow guys, Mike Lindell, he loves America. He is an American company. He has American products and they are some of the best products you can buy for your home. And right now, a six piece towel set, regularly $99.98, you can get for only $25 at mypillow.com backslash Carter with promo code Carter or call 1-800-685-7221. I swear you cannot beat that. A six-piece towel set, which is regularly $99.98. I have those in my home for $25. Please don't miss this offer. Call right now. You'll be supporting a great company and my show for a limited time. Get the MyPillow six-piece towel set regularly $99.98 for the clearance price of $25 at MyPillow.com backslash Carter with promo code Carter. There you'll find the deep discounts on all my pillow products and get your six-piece my pillow towel set for only $25. Shop mypillow.com backslash Carter, promo code Carter, 
or call 1-800-685-7221. That's mypillow.com backslash Carter or call 1-800-685-7221. Anyways, that was just one little bit of what I had to share with you. It's important. I have so much more to share with you. I've been on the border of Egypt. Um, We were in the Sinai. Uh, I was in Gaza along the border of Gaza dealing with Hamas it's very important that that is a huge, important story because it deals directly with the United States. And I'm going to explain why on my upcoming podcast. And you're also going to hear some of the um, some of the speakers that I spoke to here. They're going to talk to you about the border. They're going to talk to you about what's happening here in Israel. You do not want to miss that. Also, all the other places we visited, I haven't even touched the surface. So many historical sites, so many beautiful religious sites, and folks being close to God. Look, they say Jerusalem is the heart of God, and I absolutely believe it. There is something that happens to you here when you come here that's different than anything else you can imagine. Follow me on Truth at Sarah Carter Official on Twitter at Sarah Carter DC and on Instagram at S Carter DC. God bless you. God bless our great nation. God bless the beautiful nation of Israel. Thank you so much for welcoming me into your home and into your heart. And God bless the great state of Texas. <laughs>